Let's take a look at how we can evaluate limits from an equation. I'm going to start by taking you through this flowchart, which is going to tell you all the steps you're going to try when evaluating a limit from an equation. And I should mention in this video, when we're finding the limit of f at x as x approaches a, uh, I'm going to tell you the steps for if a is a real number. I'll teach you how to evaluate limits at infinity in a different video. So basically, you are always going to start by trying to evaluate the limit through direct substitution. You're going to sub a into your function for x and see what happens. And there's basically three things that could happen. You're either going to get uh, a number over 0, or you'll get a number, or you'll get 0 over 0. And depending on which of those three things happen, you'll be able to interpret what your next step is going to be. If your function is continuous at the x value of a, then when you sub in a for x, you'll just get a number for your answer. And then that is your limit. You have found your limit. But if your function is discontinuous at a, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to get a number over 0 or 0 over 0 when you do direct substitution. If you get a number over 0, that means the limit does not exist and then there's a vertical asymptote at x equals a. And then you can use a graph or a table to try and figure out the behavior of the function as it approaches the asymptote. It's going to have an infinite limit, meaning it's going to be going towards infinity or negative infinity. But the limit itself does not exist, but we should learn about the behavior as it approaches the vertical asymptote. If you get 0 over 0, that's called indeterminate form. And it's called that because it doesn't tell us whether the limit exists or not. What we have to do if that happens is we have to try rewriting the limit in an equivalent form and then try direct substitution again. And there are a few main strategies you can use for rewriting it in a different equivalent form. You could try factoring, you could try multiplying by a conjugate, or you could try using some trig identities. Trying those strategies will help you rewrite it in a different form so that when you do direct substitution, you'll be able to find the limit. And if all else fails, try and make a graph or a table of values where you can approximate the limit. So let me take you through some examples where we'll use these strategies to calculate some limits. Oh, and I want to remind you of some rules that we use when working with limits as well. So when we do direct substitution, we make sure that we follow these limit rules. The first rule says that uh, the limit of a sum of functions is equal to the sum of the limits. If we have a limit of a constant times a function, that's equal to the constant times the limit of the function. If we have the limit of a product of functions, that's equal to the product of the limits. And the limit of a quotient of functions is equal to the quotient of the limits. Those are all pretty self-explanatory rules. And one more thing that I should mention is the direct substitution rule. If f is a polynomial function or a rational function and a is in the domain of the f function, then the limit of f at x as x approaches c is just f at c. Direct substitution will work in that scenario. And here's a couple examples of that. Example 1 says evaluate the following limits and justify each step. Well, I know step 1 in evaluating any limit is to try direct substitution. So I'm just going to check what happens if I sub 2 in for x. So this would equal 2 times 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 7. And if I evaluate this, I have 2 times 4 is 8 minus 6 plus 7. I get 9. When you do direct substitution and you get a number, that's the answer to your limit. You found the limit. As x approaches 2, the function approaches 9. Let's try part b. Once again, step 1, try direct substitution. Let's sub negative 1 in for x and see if the function exists at negative 1. If I evaluate this, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, minus 2 minus 1, all over negative 3 minus 5. If we simplify this, in the numerator, I have negative 4. In the denominator, I have negative 8. That simplifies to a half. So my limit of the function as x approaches negative 1 is a half. So both of these functions, it was easy to find their limits by direct substitution because they were both continuous at the x value that the functions were approaching. But what happens if we have a function that is discontinuous at a point where we are finding the limit? Direct substitution is not going to work. So if we remember back to the flowchart, two things could happen. We're either going to get a number over 0 or 0 over 0. Let's start by focusing on what's going to happen if we get a number over 0, right? A number over 0 means there's a vertical asymptote there, 
And then we'll look for the behavior as we get close to that vertical asymptote by making a table. So we are reminded of that right here. When a number over zero, use a graph or table to check left and right limits to understand the behavior at the vertical asymptote. And we have a definition. A line x equals a is a vertical asymptote of the graph of a function y equals f at x if either the left or right limit as x approaches a of f at x is plus or minus infinity. So let's have a look at example two where that's going to happen to us. Let's start with 2a. When evaluating a limit, we always start by trying direct substitution. So I'll substitute 4 in for x, but I get 1 over 0. So when I have a number over 0, I know there is a vertical asymptote. So I'm going to make a note here. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals 4. So that means that the limit does not exist. Therefore, the limit does not exist. But what I will do is make a table of values for points uh, where x is approaching 4 from the left and right so we can see the behavior of the function as it approaches 4 so we can see if it's going towards infinity or negative infinity. So if I were to sub in 4 into my 1 over x minus 4 function, I know it's undefined. But what if I sub in x values that are approaching 4 from the left of 4? Let's see what the y values are going to be trending towards. If I sub in 3 to my function, I get 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1. If I sub in 3 and a half, I get 1 over negative a half, which is negative 2. If I sub in 3.9, I get 1 over negative 0.1, that's negative 10. And if I sub in 3.99, I get 1 over negative 0 0.01, which is negative 100. Notice as the x values approach 4 from the left, the y values seem to be trending towards negative infinity. So I could conclude, even though the limit doesn't exist, I could still describe its behavior by saying the limit as x approaches 4 from the left of 4, I use that little minus sign to mean from the left of 4, of the function 1 over x minus 4. Does that function have a name? No, it doesn't have a name, so we'll just write its equation. 1 over x minus 4 equals negative infinity. How about as I approach 4 from the right of 4? So as the x values approach 4 from the right, let's look at what are the y values trending towards. Well, if I sub 5 into the function, I get 1. If I sub 4 and a half in, I get 2. If I sub 4.1 in, I get 10. And if I sub 4.01 in, I get 100. It looks like as x is approaching 4 from the right, the y values seem to be getting infinitely large. They seem to be trending towards infinity. So I could describe the limit as x approaches 4 from the right of 1 over x minus 4 as equaling infinity. Let's try another example like this. Part B. We always start when evaluating a limit by trying direct substitution and seeing what happens so that we can determine our next steps. If I sub in negative 3 for x, in the numerator, I have negative 6 plus 5, that's negative 1. In the denominator, I have 0. So a number over 0 means that there is a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 3, which means the limit does not exist. So what we'll want to do again is look at what is the behavior of the function as it approaches that vertical asymptote from the left and from the right. So if I sub in negative 3 into my function, I know it's undefined. But let's start by checking what happens as I approach negative 3 from the left what's happening to the y values. So let's sub them in and see what we get. If I sub in negative 4, I get 3. If I sub in negative 3.5, I get 4. If I sub in negative 3.1, I get 12. And if I sub in negative 3.01, I get 102. So I can see as x approaches negative 3 from the left, the y values of the function seem to be approaching infinity. They're getting infinitely large. Now let's check as x approaches negative 3 from the right of negative 3, what's happening to the y values. If I sub in negative 2, I get 1. If I sub in negative 2 and a half, I actually get 0. If I sub in negative 2.9, I get negative 8. And if I sub in negative 2.99, I get negative 98. So it seems as x is approaching negative 3 from the right, the y values are approaching negative infinity. All right, so if we think back to our flowchart, let me just go back to it. 
We've now covered uh, two of the three scenarios that can happen to you. If when you try direct substitution, you get a number, you found the limit. If you get a number over zero, there's a vertical asymptote, and then you check for infinite limits as you approach that vertical asymptote. Let's now look at what happens if we get indeterminate form by trying these different strategies to write it in an equivalent form. So in this section, I'm reminding you of that here. So when we get indeterminate form of zero over zero, we try and rewrite it in an equivalent way by trying to factor and remove the discontinuity or multiply by the conjugate or use trig identities or multiply by a common denominator. Those are a few things that we can try here. And the reason why we're allowed to do this, this is like a really important law for when dealing with limits. Um, if f at x equals g at x, as long as x doesn't equal a, then the limits of both f at x and g at x as x approaches a are equal to each other, right? When evaluating a limit, it doesn't matter what is happening at the actual x value that we're approaching. We just wanna know what are the y values approaching as x is approaching a. We don't care what's happening as x equals a. So if the functions are not equal at a, that doesn't matter to us. As long as they're equal at all other points, the limits will be equal. Let me show you what I mean by that as we try example three. When we're evaluating this limit, we always wanna start by trying direct substitution. So sub in five for x and see what happens. In the numerator, I have 25 minus 35, which is negative 10, plus 10 is zero. And the denominator, I have five minus five, which is zero. This is indeterminate form. This doesn't tell us if the limit exists or not. It just means we wanna try and rewrite the function in an equivalent way and then try direct substitution again. So for this one, I'm actually going to try and factor the numerator of the function. So I'm gonna say that this is equal to the limit as x approaches five of the factored version of this. Well, the numerator is a quadratic. What multiplies to 10 and adds to negative seven is negative five and negative two. So I can factor that easily. And now I notice I have a factor of x minus five in the numerator and denominator. I could cancel those. And then I know this is equal to the limit as x approaches five of just x minus two. The reason why I'm allowed to say that these limits are equal is because this function and this function are equal to each other at all x values except the x value of five. This one is undefined when x is five, but this one is equal to three when x is five. Those are, that's the only x value where these functions differ from each other, but that's fine because we don't care what's happening at five. We just wanna know what's happening as x approaches five. That's why we're allowed to say that the limits of these two functions are equal to each other, right? That's what this rule right here is exactly stating. So now that I've rewritten it in an equivalent form, I can now try direct substitution again. So I can sub in five for x. And this time I get a number, which means I have found the limit. Even though the function does not exist when x is five, I know as x approaches five, the y values are approaching three. Let's try another one where we need a different strategy. We always start by trying direct substitution. So we'll substitute in zero for x. If I try and evaluate this, the square root of zero squared plus nine, well, that's three minus three is zero and zero squared is zero. So once again, I have indeterminate form. This doesn't tell us if the limit exists or not. So we'll try and rewrite this function in an equivalent form and then try direct substitution again. So I'll say this equals the limit as x approaches zero of, well, when I see a radical within these expressions, one of the things I think of is, well, maybe we can get rid of that square root by multiplying by a conjugate. So the conjugate of the square root of x squared plus nine minus three is the square root of x squared plus nine plus three, right? We're just creating a difference of squares. And to keep this equivalent, if I'm multiplying the numerator by that, I also have to multiply the denominator by that. So I'm really multiplying this function by one, but just in a tricky way. And then it may be helpful for you to remember your difference of squares rule. Let me just write it here. If we have an a minus b times an a plus b, so two factors that are the same, just different signs, 
we know that's equal to a squared minus b squared. It's a difference of squares. And that's exactly what I have when I multiply the numerators. Notice I have this factor times this factor where they're the exact same, except for the sign between the terms. So I know that when I multiply that out, it would equal the first term squared. So the square root of x squared plus nine squared is just x squared plus nine minus the second term squared, three squared is nine. And this is all over. I'm not gonna bother expanding the denominator. I have an x squared multiplied by a square root of x squared plus nine plus three. So let me simplify this a little bit. I'm gonna keep writing my limit statement until I actually do direct substitution again. Uh, I see I have a nine minus nine in the numerator, that's zero. So I just have x squared over x squared times the square root of x squared plus nine plus three. Now I notice that I have uh, a factor of x squared in the numerator that can cancel with the factor of x squared in the denominator, which will allow me to write an equivalent function. Well, it's equivalent as long as x doesn't equal zero, and that's perfect because we're finding the limit as x approaches zero, so we don't care what happens at zero, so we are allowed to cancel it and say that the limit is still going to be equal. So we have one over the square root of x squared plus nine plus three. And now I'll try direct substitution again and see if it works. So I have one over the square root of zero squared plus nine plus three. This gives me one over six. I got a number value when I did direct substitution, so I have found the limit. Let's try two more. Part C. Once again, if I try direct substitution, I would get sine of zero over sine of two times zero. So sine of zero, I know is zero. So I have zero over zero in determinate form. So we'll try and rewrite this in an equivalent way by using a trig identity. So I'll say this equals the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over the double angle identity for sine is two times sine x times cos x. In the numerator, I have a factor of sine x that can cancel it with the factor of sine x in the denominator. So this is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of one over two cos x. Let's try direct substitution again. So I will sub in zero for x. And cos of zero, I know is one. So I just have one over two times one, which is a half. I got a value when I did direct substitution. So I have found the limit. Our last one, let's try D. When evaluating any limit, we start with direct substitution and see what happens. If I sub in negative one, I get three minus three, which is zero over negative one plus one, which is zero. So that's indeterminate form. So we try and see, is there an equivalent way that we can write this function and then try direct substitution again. The only thing I see to try here would be to maybe get rid of this X that's in the denominator here. I don't like having a fraction over a fraction. So let me multiply this by X over X. That's just multiplying it by one. But when I do that, that's gonna get rid of the fraction in the denominator. So I'll say this equals the limit as x approaches negative one of three x plus three x squared all over one plus x. And then let me common factor the numerator and you'll see why I'm doing that after I common factor it. Uh, I can common factor a three x from both terms and that gives me one plus x. Notice I have that same factor of one plus X in the top and bottom of my function. So I can rewrite this in an equivalent form as just three X. It's equivalent as long as X doesn't equal negative one. And that's fine because we're just finding the limit as X approaches negative one. So now I can try direct substitution again and I get negative three. So I found a number, so my limit has been found. Jensen.